the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We join together in the call to worship on this Holy Friday. A cradle and a cross. And And between between these, a life. life. Bethlehem and Jerusalem. A birth birth and and a death. death. One of sorrows who sometimes wept. One One of joy who who also kept kept compassion compassion and and grace. Alive alive and and real. real. Today, may we experience the surge of Christ's life. And the the death. The beauty of Christ's Christ's love. love. The The power power of of Christ's cross. We sing the hymn number 231, When I Survey. to this Holy Friday worship service at Knox Waterloo. We gather in community together, although we are apart. Here at the foot of the cross to face pain and death, fear and to grieve. Broken, we face this uncomfortable and sacred journey together. Let us continue our prayer. God of love, on this day as we remember Jesus, our crucified and living Savior, we are huddled together in fear and doubt like the disciples of long ago. We do not want to be separated. We do not want to be forsaken. We do not want to say goodbye. We do not want to follow you with a cross. But even as we know that you invite us to accompany you into brokenness and death, we also know that you have gone before. You have faced danger, and conquered despair. As we remember the events of this day, we are brought closer to each other. 
we feel your presence with us and we know that we can go with you because your promise abides with us. Amen. Amen. One tradition in the history of the church has been to experience the stations of the cross, an artistic depiction of the Via Dolorosa, the path believed by many to be the one Jesus walked on the way towards his execution. In many churches of different traditions, the stations of the cross will appear as pieces of art on the walls somewhere within the building. And in some congregations on Holy Friday, people move from picture to picture, remembering the stories of the last moments of Jesus' life. We're not able to do that today here, but thanks to PowerPoint and live streaming, we can move from image to image wherever we happen to be right now. We can take the journey of the Via Dolorosa together. The flow of today's service will be an image will be shown Courtney will read uh, a related passage from Scripture, and I'll read a commentary from the artist with her thoughts and reflections about that particular piece of art. Following my reading, we will leave some silence, a good 30 seconds or so, to give you space to meditate on the art and feel the things you need to feel in that moment. There's no official offering today, but you can visit knoxwaterloo.ca to make a special Holy Friday gift in support of the ministries of Knox, if you wish. So about the art we're using today, Lauren Wright Pittman is an artist, graphic designer, and a theologian. She studied media design at Middle Tennessee State University, worked as a wetlands advocate in southern Louisiana, and went to seminary to piece together her passions for artistic expression, design, and creation care. While in seminary, Lauren found a passion for seeking after God and processing scripture through visual exploration. She uses canvas, canvases to image the tension, joy, sadness, beauty, and energy which she experiences in the scripture texts. Lauren and a group of other artists are part of a collective known as Sanctified Art, and we have used their material here at Knox over the past year during last Advent and during these days of Lent. The images today are used with permission. Art touches the heart. And yet our reaction to art is very often heady. To ask a question like, do I like this piece of art? Or what do I think of this style of art? Those are head questions. They're secondary questions. Instead of asking, do I like it? We could first be opening our hearts to the ways in which the image can pull us into the story. And then if we want to ask questions, we could start with questions like, what does this image say about pain and suffering? What does this image say about God? What does this image say about humanity? Those are primary questions. Our prayer today is that you may encounter something sacred, something meaningful as you experience the story today. This past year has been one of many different kinds of suffering by so many people. May you find some peace in one message of today's story that God knows our suffering firsthand. I don't believe God ever wills suffering, but God does desire that we do not suffer alone. The cross stands as a symbol of God's solidarity with us in our suffering and in the suffering of the world. May your minds and hearts be open as we experience the story of God's Friday, Holy Friday, in song, scripture, and art.
Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he, knew, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The artist, Lauren Wright Pittman, says of this image, He is utterly alone. I imagine he feels like the garden is closing in on him, with vines twisting and turning around his body and flowers stretching their petals toward his bloody tears. As he throws himself on the ground, I imagine he feels the damp soil against his face, between his toes, and under his fingertips, and shuddered, knowing that the cold ground would soon be his dwelling place. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard." So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. The kiss is an image of the affection that once bound Jesus and Judas together. But the kiss also unties trust and shatters relationship. It ushers in violence and murders love. Although Judas thinks his intentions are safely hidden, he wears the violence of his action like a shining crown. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After 
a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The rooster's crowing reminds me of the image of God as a mother hen protecting her young under her wing. I wonder if the rooster's cry is a comfort to Jesus. I wonder if the sound at once voices the cry of Jesus' own anguished heart and also reminds him that, though he is betrayed and denied, he is not alone. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply. So that Pilate was amazed. The crown represents the misunderstanding of Jesus' power. Many thought the Messiah was to be a strong, powerful, militaristic rebellion commander. Kings and governors feared he would be a threat to the crown, a menacing, dethroning force. But Jesus was a servant leader. He spent his days with and serving those who were downtrodden, poor, and meek. Jesus was condemned to death for a crown he did not wear. Pilate's hand points Jesus to his death attempting to silence the truth he spoke to power. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. 
To strike someone across the face requires looking at someone in the eyes and marring the most recognizable and identifiable part of the body. It requires facing the recipient of your rage and witnessing the consequences and destruction of your actions firsthand. It is a brazen and intimate act of violence. Continuing to misunderstand and mock Jesus' power, the soldiers craft him a crown made out of pain, a crown made out of that which protects the beauty of the bloom. In this case, however, the thorns cannot protect the beauty they surround. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. Jesus not only bears the physical weight of the cross, he also bears the weight of creation. I imagine his arms contorted behind him, grasping the edges of the cross, trying to balance the weight of it all on his back. Contemplating this great burden, I imagine his body twisted and tied to the cross by the vines of the Garden of Eden, but also held up and supported by the vines of the new creation.
A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, for the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Sometimes I grieve for that which is close to me, things I can see with my own eyes, tragedy I can reach out and touch. But Jesus asks the women to do more than that. He asks them to look beyond the immediate and tangible sorrow to the greater struggle that is to come. If they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Sometimes we get stuck in our religious grief for Jesus, We narrow our focus onto his death. We tuck it neatly into our calendar each Holy Week and place it at the far end of a fading timeline. But Jesus' death has lasting, continual, real-world consequences in the here and in the now. His death is a state-sanctioned, attempted murder of love and hope. Jesus is telling the women that their grief will be a journey and they need to be prepared, we need to be prepared. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Jesus' act of nonviolence in the face of such grotesque brutality, an act of protest against injustice, is astounding. I imagine him balling up his fists in unspeakable pain as the nails are driven into his wrists. His clenched fist symbolizes his resistance in the face of terror and state-sanctioned violence. His clenched fist signals solidarity with liberation movements that continue today and unity with those who follow in his footsteps to speak truth to power and nonviolently to resist oppression. One of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly. For we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, 
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. While speaking to the thief, I imagine Jesus' hands outstretched beneath the brilliant sun, radiating oranges, reds, and yellows. It takes great strength to find beauty in the midst of such darkness and pain. What more can he do other than offer another hope and light on their journey? Jesus' ministry on earth was about bringing the kingdom of God into the here and now. He continues his ministry in his last moments by offering hope to the thief. Jesus assures him that they will be together beyond the pain, beyond the ceasing of their breath. The kingdom of God is near, so close he can almost reach out and touch it. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her in to his own home. In this moment, I imagine if Jesus could, he would come down off the cross, walk up to his mother, and hold her in his arms, thanking her for her courage, persistence, and bravery for bringing him into the world. I imagine he would hold her face, seeing his whole life dance in the shades of green and brown of her eyes. I imagine pain welling up in her glossy eyes as she wipes away her tears. In the midst of his great pain, in the last moments of his life, Jesus takes care of his mother. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn into two, 
Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which he had hung in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. When I consider this moment in Joseph's life, I think about the normalcy and strangeness of burying a loved one. The ritual act of burial is a physical reminder of our own fragile mortality and also an affirmation that we are more than our bodies. This is a completely natural and wholly unnatural experience. We grasp onto the hope that our loved one is with God in death and at the same time everything fights within us to hold on to the physicality of those we love. I imagine Joseph, filled with despair, fights to hold on to Jesus' body, afraid to let go. I imagine he also feels grounded in faith that Jesus will not be contained. What thou, my Lord, hast sung 
Pray together. O oh God, we wonder where you are in the world. We think where we will see you is in dazzling miracles and direct interventions, but these sorts, sorts of things are so rare. And then we wonder if you are alive at all but maybe we aren't looking in the right places. We ask, where are you, God? And then we remember where you are. You are nailed to a cross. You are not a God who is removed from the human condition. You are a God who is immersed in it. You know firsthand every pain, every emotion, every struggle. You know the grief of the woman who has lost a loved one, the struggle of the man living on the street, refugees ripped from their homes, the stress of a single parent, the agony of broken vows of a covenant, the pain of a dying cancer patient. You know these things, O oh God. You have been there. You are there. You are here. And you continue to choose to suffer with us. When we wonder where you are, O oh God, and we cry, why have you forsaken me? Then we remember that you have not forsaken us. You are with us, around us, in us pouring out grace upon our wounded and weary bodies and spirits, blessing us in the midst of our suffering. We thank you, God, for this gift of grace. And we remember today those who suffer. We pray for blessing, for healing, for salvation for them. And in a time of silence, we pray for those who know pain today. For those who know the stress of work and strained relationships today. For those who live in fear and abuse. For those who know hunger. You chose faithfulness even when that faithfulness led to a cross. We offer silent prayer for those who suffer for the sake of faithfulness, whose choices to follow you have led them to a place of pain. Where are you, O oh God? You are here, suffering with us, waiting with us, giving us strength and healing to be your hands and feet to one another. Amen.
Oh. Mm-hmm.